I'm Fred McNeil and thank you for watching QAC TV 7. It's November again. It's our, my favorite time of year, one of my favorite times of the year. On November 11th, of course, we celebrate Veterans Day and we kick off every year Veterans Day a series on QAC TV 7 called Veteran Stories. And we get different men and women who are either currently serving in or have served in one of the branches of the military and they share with us their experiences. This year, we're going to kind of piggyback on what Maryland Public TV is doing. We're going to emphasize the war in Vietnam. Men and women who live in our community that serve in one of the branches of the armed forces, and they have different Vietnam experiences. Now, I have my good friend Pete Abbott. Pete, thank you for coming back for year two for Fred, you. Yes, we're going to put you on a contract. Yeah, here. I'd gladly accept that. Now, yes. I'm sitting here as before we go in there. Uh, Pete's going to tell us some stories that... Uh, some of us, we have to go back and crank up the memory. But the Vietnam era, uh, kind of most of us think of the turbulent later 60s when people were in the streets and people were upset about it or for this or whatever. But uh, Pete's going to tell us some stories. And I'm just flipping this up. These are all the awards he won, and it's a ladder going up his rank. But as Pete has told us from uh, Lieutenant J.G. all the way up the ladder to Commander, Vietnam somehow twisted its way in your life. Is that about true? Absolutely. Okay, well, why don't you do this? I'm going to kind of be quiet. Why don't you share with us your Vietnam experiences? And it's going to shock people when you mention some dates where we go back to, but go ahead. Well, thank you, Fred, thank for you. inviting me back. And uh, I want to say that my career for a young naval officer who was commissioned in and around 1960 and in my case, 59, uh, for the next uh, 15, 16 years, up until 1975, at the end of the war, uh, you could not escape being involved in this conflict. And that shocks a lot of people. Because most, again, I think most yeah. American thinks, oh, it ended kind of 74-ish, and it seemed like yeah. it was 68. But again, tell me. Well, I can assure you that... Uh, when you look at the historical context in which we were dragged into a, a war in Southeast Asia, that that war had never stopped since the uh, communist rebels, very much akin to the Castro effort in Cuba, okay. successfully uh, evicted the French from their colonial hold on Southeast Asia. In and just so everybody knows, before America got involved, the French were involved and... Well, they had been colonially uh, the custodians of Southeast Asia or Indochina or whatever you want to call it for a hundred years. And Pete, in 68, 69, when I was in Vietnam, just to interrupt for a second, my outfit, 43rd Signal Battalion, we actually were housed in a French plantation. It was a rubber plantation. I mean, the yes. influence was that good. Oh, abso you, absolutely. I, I, I can match that story okay. with something we'll talk about here in okay. a minute that tells you about the French. But mm -hmm. I, the point being is that we could have foreseen a, a much clearer picture of what was going to happen to us. us had we paid attention to the history of the anti-colonialism in the region. I think if you were a betting man in 1959 when I put on my ensign bars and I went to the USS Black, my first ship, a World War II destroyer, that at the end of a decade and a half of involvement in Vietnam, that we weren't going to come away much better than the French. Well, didn't MacArthur at some point say, don't get in a land war in Asia? How <laughs> yeah. many experts? And then we had this thing called the domino theory and this yeah, and that. Right. But an awful lot of people, military and civilian, way back as late as the, or as early as the Eisenhower administration and the early Kennedy administration were saying, guys, no, just, just don't go there. Yeah. But anyway, very good. You can let me just since you mentioned it, let's talk about our first little aid here. What do we got? Well, this is a picture of the USS Black. That's a Fletcher class destroyer, one of the famous ships from World War II, built in 1943 in Orange, Texas, and served honorably in the Pacific Theater through the end of World War II, all through the Korean War. Never was decommissioned and was in home ported in Long Beach when I graduated in 1959 from UCLA, from UCLA just up the street. Right, right. I got commissioned uh, an hour after I got my diploma 
And at 3 o'clock that afternoon, my mother <laughs> dropped me off at the ship. <laughs> Welcome Long to Beach. the Navy. <laughs> and, uh, well, it was a kind of a rushed deal because I had orders to another ship in San Francisco, but they got canceled at the last minute. Somebody was kind enough to give me an option whether I wanted to go to an ammunition ship or a destroyer, and I picked the destroyer. Uh, fast and gray and fleet okay. <laughs> and get out there and go do a young man's job and happen to be on an old ship but they still ran 36 knots and had four or five inch guns. A little more fun. Yeah, a lot more fun to drive and twin screws sure. and, you know, the Greyhound Navy. So that was the first experience I had at sea with, uh, with the Navy as a commissioned officer. And we left for a six-month deployment to the Far East the day after I graduated. And remind everybody the year. 1959. Okay, so, so Eisenhower is still president. Yes, sir. Okay, all yes. right. All right, and most of us, besides the French involvement in uh, Vietnam or Southeast Asia, knew nothing about a Vietnam. Right. Well, that's correct. Okay. Uh, one, of the, one of the great turning points in Southeast Asia was uh, the battle at Dien Bien Phu when the... And remind Re everybody what, what that was all about. Well, the French colonial administration was headquartered in Hanoi, and they Which had, many of us referred, used to, in the old days, we say North Vietnam. North Vietnam. Oh, but now that's it's right. part of it. Yeah. Now it's the capital of Vietnam, right. having consolidated the entire country right. again. Right. But the division occurred after the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, when the French lost severe, I mean, major numbers of people. And the the guy who ran the opposition force was a general by the name of Gap. Who became a hero not yeah. only for that event, but also the Vietnam And War. he was Ho Chi Minh's right-hand right. man, right. and they had been buddies since they were youngsters and gone to school together. Okay. And uh, But Gap was their... Uh, Military the, genius. He was the right. patent, yeah. uh, okay. you know, the yeah. guy who really pulled it together and forced the French to flee. Right. And then, let's remind everybody, Dem Dem Phu... Was so basically about thirty miles southwest of Hanoi, okay. and up in the hills, uh, and the French chose a strategy to build what they they called hub and and uh, spoke spoke defenses, where each at each hub there was a big fort. Right. And they tried to control the communications and the roadways. And it was exactly between. that. It's a fort. I mean, and it was it was no, not a it, city. It was a fort. It actually had seven different components. Okay. Uh, of the fort, but it was a very large set sure, of structures, sure. and there were 20,000 Frenchmen there. Well, in a matter of a very few days, the Viet Minh at that time, which is what they were called, right. not the Viet Cong, because that was the southern rebellious mm -hmm. force, but the Viet Minh army under Gap demolished the French forces and forced the surrender of the few who were remaining alive. And that was heavy military bombardment. They had received a an enormous amount of modern weaponry and artillery from the Chinese okay. and the Russians. Nobody really picked up on that. And these were hidden in the mountains. Yes, the they, hills had, they had positioned the right? guns yeah. so that they could fire down on the fort from elevated positions. Terrible around. tactics Awful, on the French part. Just, right? just terrible. The worst. I mean, you don't have to be a West Point graduate <laughs> to understand how bad <laughs> the French. G.I. Joe, comma guys, handled, no, don't do that. Right, yeah. But anyway, so General Gap beats the French so bad that they become untenable in terms of the political position back in France and they people say get out. They Just get, get out. out. They had they, that in Algeria going yeah, on. Yeah, get both, out, get both out, at get the out, same time it was pretty rough yeah, on, yeah. on the French. But anyway, now now you create a government in being uh, which is set and determined to implement a full communist government and culture and society on Vietnam. And you had a group of people in the North as well as the South who were anti-communist right. and wanted to continue their... And this, and just to remind everybody, this was the height of the Cold War. Absolutely. I mean, it was two teams, right? Yeah. The communists and the anti-communists. When we say these terms, you know, good guys, bad guys, was a philosophical and political difference, right? Well, cult, and it extended to the culture and the attitudes and the international relations and the peripheral disagreements on the fringe between NATO mm -hmm. and the United States and Russia and China and all the big CETA, players. Right? And, there yeah, was all, ASEA, and, ASEA yeah. and all of yeah. those you know, okay. Asian forces. So even in 54, when this thing happened at Tianbin right. Pew, 
it wasn't long before the communist forces really had a foothold and they had a big brother in next door in China who Giving wasn't supply. who wasn't going to let them fail. And who ended up feeling their oats because of what happened in the uh, Korean War, exactly. right? They kind of got away yes. with some things that now a lot of us scratch our heads. Forget it, you talk. I'll be you, you got it. No, right. I mean, I, I, just we're, we're setting a stage yeah. on the world stage of current events, if you will. Mm -hmm. you got to go back a few years, but at the time, the current events in Southeast Asia did not look good yeah. Yeah. for democracy and Western influence, and we see the North Vietnamese taking over. We see the communists taking over Laos. And the domino theory came into effect. Yeah, that people if we lose this country, we, right. boom, boom, boom. they're right. going to go right. right on down to Singapore, and the next thing they'll be in Australia, and okay. yeah, San Francisco okay. will be next. Now, I've so. got in-laws in Australia, so be careful. <laughs> okay. Well, but I, all I'm telling you is yeah. that that theory dominated a lot of political military sure. thinking sure. in the United States about what would our response be going forward right. when the French were driven out and we began to get appeals for assistance, which the French did, and we didn't help them. But the people in the South, because in 1962, a lot of people don't remember this, and I was out there when when this happened. And you, and again, remind and everybody, I was still on board the USS Black. Okay. Yes, right. there there were uh, there was a flotilla of naval and merchant ships aggregated to go to Hanoi in 1962 and remove 300,000 non-communist citizens who wanted, to go who wanted to go down to Saigon and the North Vietnamese government said, okay, this is it. But once those ships sail and head south down the coast, the door is closed. Nobody else leaves. It is the 17th parallel we are the North Vietnamese, and you guys down there are the South Vietnamese, and we'll see where things go from here. Now, 1962, we're not very far from 1964. And in 1964, some things had happened to me from the time I left the black as a Lieutenant JG, and I went to Stanford University to teach in the Navy ROTC program as an associate professor, assistant professor of naval science. I spent my two years there, and in that two-year period... 62, 64, okay. Kennedy's death, LBJ yes, gets elected president, Kennedy died right? in 63. Kennedy was killed in between my classes, okay. and I had the terrible mission to have to go in and announce to a group of freshman students at Stanford the death of John Kennedy. that the president had been assassinated. And it, it was really a very troublesome day for all of us. Sure. But the impact of the troubles in Southeast Asia, the building momentum of assistance and likelihood of force introduction. It started with advisors yes, and more know, advisors. Yeah, the junk yeah. for, and in the Navy's case, it was the patrol boat guys. We were developing little boats to go up the rivers, mm -hmm. and we were putting American naval officers as advisors to the South Vietnamese Junk Force Navy okay. that existed in all the little ports and harbors up and down the coast. Is there only a 62, 64 time? Yeah. Okay. So I, I ended up actually, when I finally did get to be an exec as a lieutenant commander, I went to an executive officer's assignment. I went to a new construction destroyer called the Meyer Cord, Okay. And that was named for Dale Meyer Cord, who was the first U.S. naval officer killed in the Vietnam War. Are you kidding me? Yeah. What so, was he? Was that um, early sixties? Yeah, he was killed about sixty-five. Oh, okay. I think. All right. Sixty. Sixty-four. Okay. 64 just as things started to just take a, off. Yeah. yeah. yeah okay. Now sixty-four. I got orders to go be the commanding officer of the little two ninety Gannett. Okay. I'm talk a about the two ninety. First year second. lieutenant. Okay. The Gannett was one of two uh, MS. Coastal minesweepers, in the Navy language, MSCs, minesweeper coastals, as opposed to MSOs, which were minesweeper oceans. These were small 150-foot wooden ships, diesel-powered, five officers, 35 men. It's fairly small. Crew, and commanded small by ship. young lieutenants. Okay. And there were nine of those ships, home ported in Sasebo, Japan. So at the end of my tour at Stanford, 
I got a set of orders to go be the captain of the Gannett. Okay. And Gannett and Albatross were the two ships of this class. They were the newest of the wooden sweepers, built in uh, Michigan by uh, Peterson Brothers, uh, one of the finest shipbuilders on the lakes up there. Uh, and uh, it, it, I was the third captain. She was pretty new. Okay. Only two people had, five, had it before you. Yeah, you, five you or six. On. She was five okay. or six years old when right. when I got her. But a great, great little ship. Until we actually had to get underway and do things, and, and then, <laughs> okay. the, then the engine, then, it, then the, then the engine, engine quit. Then the engine started to blow up. <laughs> okay. But that's another story. We'll right. we'll get to that. So, so you're assigned, and this is let's go back. Help me with the years. This is 64, 64. Yeah, 64 to now 66. Are you mine sweeping rivers or near the coast or what? All coastal stuff. Okay. And uh, you're, t you're looking for mines that and someone well, had planted? Let, let, using, let, yeah, let, me, let me explain to you where the, the, where the Navy got involved in right. Vietnam okay. in the early days. I said we had some people that were advisors that went to the Vietnamese Junk Force Navy right. in the south. But then we also started to do our own patrolling on behalf of the, the yeah, country, our South support Vietnam. forces, and our, when our people started to go in as the actual okay. troops, right. we needed to have some support on the waterways because they were so important in logistics support and escape and evasion and all that. So we added a, a whole force called the Riverine Force, okay. the Brown the Water brown, Navy. The brown, okay. and, right. and the, the minesweepers were part of the brown water navy, but we were able to do a little more deep water stuff if we had to. And that's reminding the we called it brown water. They were smaller yeah. rivers yes. that we'd go up with patrol yes. boats and then do whatever the yeah, navy had to do. But what happened in '64, mm -hmm. and I got to Japan on a Friday night and was bunked in a hotel actually the officers club in a okay. one room place with my former wife and a three month old child mm. no, no air conditioning and it's in July oh, in God. Japan and it's hotter Brutal. and stickier and wet, wetter than here mm. and the guy that I re relieved as the skipper pulled me into the back end of the train station after we pulled in at midnight after three mm. days of travel from San Francisco and he whispered in my ear and he said Pete I hate to tell you but we're leaving on Monday morning, mm. and we're not coming. You had a wife and a baby in Japan, and, and you're leaving. And you can't tell them. Mm. We're going to go out for what is ostensibly going to be a day of engineering trials. And but seven going. months later, we got back. Mm. Well, we were supposed to be home a year. That was the promise before another deployment. Now, where, let me just say, you know, because a lot of people say, the wife and child are put into military housing, or were they sent back to the States? No, eventually they were welcomed to share a house with another wife okay. and her child, okay. whose husband was due for orders and was going to be leaving. So we got the house. You got the house. When they left, my wife was there, but I wasn't you for another several there. months, and <laughs> she had a house. And anyway, a roof over her head and could get out of the officers' okay. club. And that, that was a very distressing period of time for everybody in terms of the personal life. The price the spouse has to pay is well, difficult. Well, it, it was pretty rough. Uh, anyway, our, so you're, you're, you're offering support for the Brown Water Navy. Yeah, okay. so we, we get underway from Sasebo, uh, July Japan, something right? or other, I okay. forget, in 1964, and we go south, and we head to f the Philippines, okay. to Subic Bay, which is the big the Navy, Navy base, station. you know, and we pull into Subic, and we are going to be there. How for long of a trip just from Japan to the Philippines? Oh, it's like 12, 1,500 miles, something oh. like that. I mean, several days okay. at eight knots, you know, okay. which is our speed yeah. of advance. We're not exactly speed. You're just taking your time. These yeah. things could not go more than 10 miles an hour. Hmm. A minute. I don't care how many engines you have. <laughs> okay. So anyway, we get to Subic. We have the change of command. And the guy leaves, and I take over. And two days later, we pull in to... Denang. Oh, so right to right to Vietnam. Okay. Right to Vietnam. Denang so, now became when I was there the very big port where not only people but supplies came in. What was Denang like in '64? Well, it was uh, pretty primitive. Oh, I'm at, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, but even at that early 
time, the South Vietnamese and the U.S. government were beginning to develop a capability of high-speed night raider speedboats mm -hmm. that operated out of a place called MACSOG, which was the Military Assistance Command Special Operations Okay, MACV. Group. Which Ma one? Well, Mac this was MACSOG. It Mac was a black Sog. project. And okay. We weren't so, supposed to know yeah, about it. Yeah. Okay. Well, these guys ran a bunch of Swedish-built, nasty PT-class mm -hmm. boats that ran about 75 And this is knots. all going on 64, yeah, 65? Yeah, okay. yeah. So, anyhow, we're watching all this build up, and I had a chance to meet Roger Staubach, because oh, Roger was the supply officer yes. in okay. for Did you catch any of his passes? No, okay. no, but one of the guys in my squadron was uh, uh, Joe Bellino. Who was the other? Number twenty-seven in Massachusetts. That's right. Other Heisman Trophy. You, you know Joe. Well, Joe, yes. Joe was the XO on the other two eighty-nine class so MSC. The one Albatross. Heisman Trophy. Yeah. Starbuck, a Starbuck was stationed in Vietnam. He was he was a supply officer and okay. had his tour of duty. In and Vietnam. then Joe Bellino is with you. Okay. Well, and my, when my parents came to visit in Japan mm -hmm. later that year. Uh, Joe's ship was in overhaul in Sasebo. They were the okay. only one of nine that didn't make the trip, so Joe acted as my uh, host, if you will, okay. for my parents. So you got to know Joe Bonina. And, and we found out, because my dad was a very good golfer, he was okay. a scratch golfer, Joe took him golfing a bunch of times, and Joe was a scratch golfer. Lord. Yeah, and he scored 40 points in a game the of Navy basketball. Navy is a small world within a big world. He right? bowled a two, 240 average and was a hell of a baseball player, besides being a Heisman yeah, Trophy yeah. winning baseball. He was uh, an all-around athlete. athlete. Joe, yes, Joe Bueno was. was a really good guy, but I thank Joe to this day for hosting okay. my folks right. while we were all together. Out of Vietnam. I'm doing, impressed. And man's dropping some names on doing, us. Doing All our, right. Doing Two our, Heisman <laughs> Trophy winners. <Yeah. laughs> the only one. Maybe, George like Harvey that. won an award from yeah. the Board of Ed as a yeah. trophy. Way I, to can't, go. I can't match the Heismans. But go ahead. Yeah. How about that? So anyway, we're we're there. We're in we're in Vietnam. We start off uh, in Da Nang, and we start. We do a long transit down the coast, down to a place called Vung Tau, okay. which was right above the entrance of the big. Uh, Estuary that leads in to Saigon. Okay. And into the it's all the Brown Navy, Brown yeah, War and Navy all guys. Of that yeah. stuff. Okay. That's the old colonial right. uh, plantation areas, okay. the French owned farming and uh, mining and all that fishing stuff. Uh, very heavy concentration of the Chinese population of okay. Vietnam lives down in that southern area. So we start off operationally in Vung Tau doing a survey of the bottom we, we had very good type of we had yeah. very good sonars in these little ships because they were used to find mines lying on the bottom okay and you had to be able to almost be able now, to the read North the Vietnamese, label on. with the help of the Chinese and Russians who was laying the mines well we did we didn't oh. know oh you didn't know we, okay. we our job was to go in there and see and make sure that the places were clean were clear okay and then, if need be, could be dredged out to depths oh, for so the big ships, ships to go in to supply. Okay. And these ports, and Cameron Bay was the biggest supply okay. center in the world during the war. And we the Russians use after we left. Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. They took, well, they had, yeah. When we left, trillions of dollars worth of yeah. stuff there yeah. for them. I think they, they, got, they got something like 10,000 diesel engines that mm. they scavenged out of all the boats and cars mm. and vehicles and jeeps. And so it was a beautiful anyway, port. Yeah. yeah. So you were talking about going in there, about being stationed at a French right. place. Right. So yeah. We get up the coast. We go from Vung Tau and we did some other place, and then we get to Cameron. And the, the, the routine was fairly... Uh, we, we'd go out and we'd do our sonar searches, and we'd right. sweep the place to see if there were any old, dangerous things left from World War II. Oh, from because, World War because we II. just okay. flew thousands of missions out of Halsey's aircraft, and they sunk... So the Lord knows what was dropped. So in. when you entered in 64, and you went inside the inner harbor right. of of Cameron Bay, a big, big yeah. harbor. I mean, yeah. it was like going into Long Beach. Sure. But on your left, oh, it's not a surprise, I don't recognize that ship, but there's a destroyer laid over on its side up on the breakwater inside the harbor and happens to be a Japanese destroyer. Sunk by the Sunk Americans. by Halsey's forces in 44. Mm -hmm. So here we are, 20 years later, that ship Cleaning is still that sitting mess, there. Yeah. Still sitting there. It's been scavenged, yeah, yeah. but the hull is still there. And on the right side of the entry is a fully 
unfunctional French Foreign Legion fort, which was the guardian fort with the guns to seaward, the guarding the yeah. entry into the things that the French had had yeah. back in the fifties. There's a little history book right so, there. So, World War II, the French so and, and as you come in and you look, you say, "What's going on out there in the distance?" And it's the little old ladies in the black suits and the pagoda shaped hats, hats and, and the mamasan hats and the water buffaloes till, <laughs> tilling the, the land. land. And I've got some photographs somewhere at home of the first day going in that I took with some old snapbox <laughs> camera in 64. And, and this was Vietnam. This is what we did. Welcome to Vietnam, 1964. But, but down in Vang Tau, our first stop, all the skippers were invited to come ashore and have a meeting with the district chief and the local rep from the U.S. government. Oh, you, okay. And... They gave us some information. The briefing was pretty insightful. They said, We're, you're welcome to come in, bring your crew in, have dinners at night, use the restaurants and enjoy mm -hmm. the town, mm -hmm. all that. But you got to be out by 10 o'clock because between 10 and 11, the place transitions to the Viet Cong, and they own it from they 11 till night. sunrise. Okay. And if you're on the streets, you're going to die. So make sure your guys know to get back to the ship before 11. Mm -hmm. And th this... It, <laughs> You're kind of your head swimming. You're the skipper. What do you mean, they own here? Twenty-eight years old. You're right. going into a war zone. Well, that was one thing that happened. And the next day, we're out at anchor, and I got guys in flak jackets and armed guards on the deck, you know, to make sure oh, that no, some some there? guy doesn't come in and speed up. You know, we're still thinking the yeah. old Sampan name. And out comes a speedboat full of lovely young American women driven by a guy, and they're out of the embassy in Saigon, oh, okay. and, and Bung Tao is the rec center for all oh, the America. Okay. They got oh, a party no. going that night, and they go around the ship. Can you imagine a bunch of guys out there thinking they're about what, to go? What was your crew now? <laughs> 35, 35 guys. 35 guys <laughs> leaning over the starboard side. Yeah, looking exactly right. Yeah. Everybody's on deck, waving. And, it's like when uh, donut dollies <laughs> came for the GIs, right? Yeah. And the guys are being invited to come to this party. The you oh. got to come in tonight. I'm thinking, God, I'm worried <laughs> mutiny, about my mutiny. ship sinking out. <laughs> but, but it was just this dichotomy that you were presented with. Here's a, here's a bunch of people in Saigon. They haven't had the war really happen yet. Yeah, it's been yeah. kind it's of It's out like, here in the suburbs. It's yeah. kind of like a low-level ISIS yeah. problem yeah. in an area yeah. where they haven't really decided to get too nasty yet. Saigon and that area yeah. are all safe cities. Right? So, yeah. any, anyhow, they, they, this, this is a crazy you know, the, And we'll talk about this. The Vietnam, well, I don't think ever changed. I was in Play Coup in 68, yeah. 69. We owned Play Coup during the day, and we were told the exact same thing. Yeah. GIs, people always say, well, what was it like when you went into Play Coup? We didn't go into Play Coup. No. We weren't allowed to. Yeah. So here you were in 64, 64 same, same, same thing. Well, the reason that we really got the message is that in Bung Tau, when we went in for this first visit with the local authorities, okay. they drove us out uh, not very far from the center of town, about three miles out, and we drove by the burned out body of a school bus. A Vietnamese school bus? Yes. Yeah. And 35 or 40 children had died killed. in this bus, and it was destroyed by a grandmother on a bicycle with a basket oh, full yeah. of hand grenades that went by the side of the open windows and tossed a grenade into every second or third window and just kept pedaling on. Mm. Pete, you know what, we're going we're to stop here in a second, but the story you just told, to me that just summarizes Vietnam. Yeah. Did we, someone in 64, maybe Cyrus Vance was the guy that yeah. did it, should have seen, guys, you, you ain't never going to win, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, look, at, I apologize, we've got to stop now, but here's the good uh, news, we'll tell everybody at home, that's 30 minutes already. Oh, really? It goes that quick, because oh. your stories are so good. What we're going to do, we're going to have you back next Monday, yep. and that we'll make a mental note. We can continue with okay. 64 and go there. And if we take a couple Mondays, that's fine. We're going to go okay. through the Vietnam experience. Is that all right with you? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm all for it. Uh, I really appreciate the chance no, to no. kind of share with this people what was lesson. going on. Because from that stop in Vung Tau until I was on an airplane coming home after a surgery of having a leg go bad in right, a baseball right, game right. in Subic, <laughs> in 65, and two of these seven-month trips back-to-back -back separated by five weeks. It got crazier every time. Well, right? Yeah. A lot of things happened which will make people stop and remember some key historical 
items on well, the calendar. Let's do this. Let me stop now. We're Folks, you're watching Veteran Stories on QAC TV 7. I'm with Pete Abbott. We're going through his Vietnam experiences. Right now, we're 1964. When we come back next week, we're going to keep going right up the time scale, okay? Yep. Pete, as usual, we'll, thank you very much. We'll for do a little more, more quickly. We're okay. We're time. all right. Yeah. I'm Fred McNeil. You're watching QAC TV 7, and you're watching Veteran Stories.